Well, good evening. So, those of you who work in Awana, um, I, I realize that it's not every week that something amazing happens. Some weeks you're just glad that you survived and uh, <laughs> you got to the end of the night and nobody was hurt in a major way. Um, but there is something to be said for that, just the faithfulness of going through the scriptures week after week after week after week. And so let me just remind you not to be discouraged. I think that if there wasn't a WANA program, the king that we're looking at tonight was in it, okay? <laughs> just just going to throw that out there. Um, all right, so we've been going through uh, the kings, and uh, we've actually come uh, to this period of time where the, the northern kingdom is, is done. Um, and you can see, here are the prophets uh, scattered among, and there's more down below. But uh, um, th this is where we're at. We looked at 2 Kings chapter 17, which was finishing up the northern kingdom. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria. Uh, bad news. Really tragic news. I, I mean, uh, I, it, it is hard for us to lose our homes, all right? Whether through fire or uh, through foreclosure or, or whatever. Um, for the Jew, though, I think there's an extra burden there that we don't quite understand. We feel, well, we can move from Avoca to Prattsburg to, you know, Cohocton to, you know, Pennsylvania to back. And that, you know, in some ways is like you know, North Carolina to El Paso, Texas. Who knows that one? Um, and, and we, you know, it's America. You know, for the Jew, the land is part of the covenant promise. And God has bound that in. And, and so this... <laughs> This is a tearing away that I don't think that we quite understand. This is the judgment of God. Um, and it was because they had sinned against him over and over and over again. And he had waved a red flag over and over again by all of his prophets and still. But this is amazing. We come to 2 Kings 18. Look at this. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the, son, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And that's not all, because we have have another kings that that's going to be true of according to all that his father David had done right this is this is we're hearkening way back to the beginning a man after God's own heart and Hezekiah where does he come from well he comes from he's the son of one of the most wickedest kings of Judah Ahaz was his dad right who who figured out that he could build an Assyrian altar in place of God's altar. All right, it's hard to get worse than that. God should have just said melt and been done with him. He should have. But he didn't. And from that, by the grace of God, comes this king Hezekiah. Can God turn a nation around in a day? I, 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 I surely hope you don't doubt that anymore. I mean, after this last year, uh, God, what God can do in, in, a, in a nation in, in a week is, you know, terrifying. God can do so much more. Can God raise up a godly man? Yes. Now, true. His grandfather and his great-grandfather are also godly kings, okay? There, there is some influence there, uh, undoubtedly. 
Not to mention the fact that Hezekiah at least evidently has a little bit of discernment and can see that the northern kingdom is going down the tubes. And then he sees that God judges them by taking them out. Does that have an impact? I'm fairly sure that has an impact on on Hezekiah. Um, And this is amazing. Verse 4, this is part of the reason why it says that he followed after David. If you'll remember, most of the kings that we've read about, they did write what was, what was right in the sight of the Lord, yet they did not remove the high places. But look at verse 4. He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image, and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. 700, almost 800 years before, Moses had been leading the children of Israel in the wilderness, and they had been complaining like normal, and God said, enough, let the serpents loose. They cry out, and God shows mercy again, you know, Judgment of God is their hope. Yeah, yeah, we'll, 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 Moses put together this bronze serpent, raise it up on a pole, whoever looks at it will live. Great. But then they take the relic and they keep it. Is that a bad thing? No. Actually, you know, think through the number of times God tells them to build a pile of rocks. This is to be a memorial. Whenever your kids say, hey, what's, the, what's with the pile of rocks? You're supposed to say, our God did amazing things right here. You're standing in the very spot where God parted the Jordan River and let us walk through. Whoa. God must be a great God. God is a great God. Son, never forget, God's a great God. God tells them to put Certain things in the, the uh, Ark of the Covenant to remember that God is a great God. Was it necessarily a bad thing that they kept this? I, I don't think so. What was bad was the way they ended up using it. All right? It replaced God. They, they, they worshipped it. And, you know, you got to give Hezekiah his due. Because he stands up in church and says, we're not going to do it that way anymore. Right? <laughs> this is a, this is, it's, a, it's, a, it's an antique. You can't destroy this. Too bad. <laughs> We've always worshipped this thing. Not anymore. Right? And, and realize it's the same thing with the high places. For hundreds of years now, this has been going on. And he... He rises up and says, look, have you seen what the Assyrians have done to our cousins? God's not joking about this. Let's get rid of it. And David, that was one of the things that David did well. He did not worship idols. He did not allow the worship of idols. He also had a soft heart to repent when he sinned. This is what sets Hezekiah above. He he calls the people and as a leader forces the people. Do do I think it was a popular decision? Probably not. I'm I'm rather sure it wasn't. Um, Isaiah 42. Remember Isaiah would have been ministering Uh, Just prior to this, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Um, Hezekiah says, look, we're going to worship the Lord, we're going to worship the Lord God only. And so, verse 5, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. God sets him way up on the ladder. We're going to come to 
uh, Josiah, you know, another reformer in uh, just a couple of generations, but none like Hezekiah. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. He subdued the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from watchtower to fortified city. (laughs) So, in studying the prophets, I, I... it always amazes me in Daniel, the four kingdoms that God picks, okay? Um, and God picks them for his purposes, and he's got in mind what he's doing. But you do realize that Assyria was actually a bigger kingdom than Babylon, right? Just not quite as classy. They were, they were, they were wicked, which is why God sends two prophets to them. But Assyria is just uh, huge. And Hezekiah, in little old Judah, says, "Uh Uh-uh, we are not. I know my dad made alliances with you. I know my dad worshipped your God. But no, we are not. (laughs) It's just like David and Goliath times three or four. Okay, this is unreal. And so he rebels, and what that... Next part there, he subdued the Philistines, is not just like, um, well, that's stuff you don't have to worry about. (laughs) Assyrians are in the north, and Egypt's in the south. And Egypt's got, you know, treasure and gold and and all kinds of great stuff. And the Assyrians want to rule over Egypt. But there's only one way to get to Egypt, the Via Maris. And the Via Maris goes through Philistine country. And so Hezekiah takes over the Philistine area and blocks the Via Maris and says, ain't going to happen, guys. You can't have this land either. I mean, he trusted in the Lord his God. And he held fast to him. And I, I, I think we need to remember that. We need to think through that. How do we hold fast? Um, Luke chapter 8 tells us the parable of the sower, right? The, the sowers, the seed, he sows the seed, the seed's the word of God, and, and it lands in four different soils. Uh, you know, we, we have the devil coming and taking away the word. We have uh, the ones on the rock who spring up and then have no root, and they fall away in time of testing. Verse 14, what fell also among the thorns or get choked out, gets choked out by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. And then you come to verse 15. As for that good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. Right? There, there's something to be said for choosing to follow and hanging on at all costs. Um, First Thessalonians 5, we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. And I, I can't imagine that Hezekiah basically put this into practice long before Paul wrote it. Right? Admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Guys, you've got to give up the high places. <laughs> Guys, this Nahushtan, it, it's got to go. Verse 15, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil. Always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Come down to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies. Verse 21, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. There there is... It is easy for us to allow what's right and true to slip away, to, to, to have it be diluted. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. That's what helps to sanctify us, to cleanse us, right? It is holding fast um, to what's right. James 4, draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Um, hang on to to what is right and true Uh, 
Revelation 3, <laughs> to the church of Philadelphia, he writes, uh, I know your works. I've set before you an open door. Uh, and, and hold, verse 11, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. In the midst of hard times, don't lose sight of what's important. So, back to 2 Kings 18. Because <laughs> Hezekiah's not perfect. Okay? God summarizes and says what, what Hezekiah is, is going to be known for in God's economy. But he also doesn't miss some of the problem. 2 Kings 18, verse 9. It came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, the Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. Why? Because he's mad. <laughs> he, you know, you're, you're rebelling. Uh, and at the end of three years, they took it. In the sixth year of Hezekiah, that is, the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. So they, they take away the northern kingdom. Then the king of Assyria carried Israel away, captive to Assyria, put them in Hala and by the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes, because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant, all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded, and they would neither hear nor do them. What you'll recall is pretty much a quote from 17. God's now said this twice, <laughs> and Hezekiah was wise and listened uh, to what he had said. So, verse 13. In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Hold it, what? I thought he followed God. I thought he trusted God. I thought God was blessing him. Yes, yes, yes. But, God also allows hardship. And so if you're sitting in Jerusalem, and all of a sudden this big, big army comes up against you and takes away all your cousins and then starts taking away all your cities, what do you do? Panic, that's what I do. I, I mean, it, it would seem. But what does Hezekiah do? He holds fast, but understand there's there's a difference of opinion here um 14th year Sennacherib king of Israel came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them and Hezekiah king of Judah sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish saying I have done wrong turn away from me whatever you impose on me I will pay and the king of Assyria assessed Hezekiah king of Judah 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold it's a fortune so Hezekiah, probably with the thought that there's no way you're going to be able to get that to me, and so we'll just come in and conquer you. But Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. So understand, Hezekiah is now in year 14. He's turned the people around. He's gotten rid of the high places. He's reinstituted the temple worship. And he's, he's overlaid the pillars again with the glory that God has blessed him with. The success, the, the gold is to be glory for God that, that you know, he's provided. And then when Sennacherib comes and has taken, he goes to him at Lachish and and basically says, I'm sorry, what will it take to make it right? And, and then strips away a lot of what advances they'd made. Now, my personal <laughs> thought as we, I study through this is, this is a huge mistake. Right? What we don't see is him going to God and saying, help. There's a problem here. Um, and from what follows, this doesn't actually work. It's not like he bought Sennacherib off and Sennacherib says, okay, fine, you can have your vassal state and that's fine. That's not what's going to happen. It's going to get worse. But if you read Second Chronicles, 32, 
Um, some of the commentators say this was a stall tactic. Hezekiah uses this as a stall tactic. And what Second Chronicles 32 tells us is, is that his strategy was um, as the armies are coming in, they decide that the one thing that they're going to do is they're going to starve them of water. And so they fill in all of the wells in the approach to Jerusalem. And then what does Hezekiah do? The greatest engineering feat of all time. One of the greatest engineering feats of all time. What is it? He builds a tunnel. And they start from opposite ends. And it would be one thing if the tunnel was straight. But the tunnel is not straight. But the tunnel precisely meets. They still haven't figured out how Hezekiah's architects have done it. Okay? And it's an underground water source, the Pool of Siloam at the bottom, and a great reservoir, so that the people of Jerusalem have water in the midst of a siege. All right, which is a very important thing to have. But my question would be is, was it worth the price? And God doesn't tell us. But I think that a God who can say, melt, <laughs> and it mel they melt, could have had a different strategy at this point. But the story's not done, okay? The story's not done. Like I said, he's paid him off, and you would hope that that would have gotten rid of him. Uh, 20,000 pounds of silver and 2,000 pounds of gold is a huge, huge amount. Um, let's go to 2 Kings 18, verse 17. So after he's paid him off, then the king of Assyria sent the Tartan, the Rabsaras, and the Rabshaka from Lachish with a great army against Jerusalem to King Hezekiah. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. When they had come up, they went and stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool, which which I found to be interesting after I'd studied through the whole Hezekiah's tunnel. They, they, they had buried all the water, and so when these three guys come into town, where do they want to stand? They want to stand by the water because um, evidently they haven't had water in a while or running water. I, it just, it's funny to me that that would be where they would meet, which was on the highway to the fuller's field. And when they had called to the king, Eliakim the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and Joah the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to them. Because realize what an uh, insult this is. Uh, Shalmaneser is evidently in Lachish, but he sends his representatives. And the king says, well, fine, I can send you representatives as well. So you six guys just meet out there by the aqueduct. That's fine. All right. It's kind of intimidating, though, that the three are are at the aqueduct. They're, they're close to the city. All right. Um, uh, let me see. So, actually, the, the three guys, you know, the, the Tartan, Rav Saris, and the Rav Shaka are probably not names or titles. Uh, the Tartan means viceroy. So, it was probably Sennacherib's second in command. The Rav Saris is the chief of the eunuchs, which mostly has to do with the king's household. The Rav Shaka uh, means something like the chief baker, which I thought was kind of odd but probably was indicating he was uh, Sennacherib's chief steward. Okay, So they would have been the upper echelon of the king of Assyria's court, and he sends them, and Hezekiah says, fine, we'll send you three guys too. And uh, verse 19, Then the Rabshakeh said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this in which you trust? You speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. And in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Now look. You're trusting in the staff of this broken reed Egypt on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. Which was actually a pretty true statement. Uh, you, you can't trust Egypt. As a matter of fact, it's kind of, it should have been a slap in the face, a no, no, a red flag. Let's go back to that analogy. Should have been a big red flag to these guys. What had God said? I've delivered you from Egypt. Never, never, never go back to Egypt. Never trust Egypt. Don't trust their horses. Don't trust their chariots. Don't trust them. And evidently, as blocking the Via Maris and, and protecting Egypt, 
Hezekiah had at least made overtures, and uh, the Rab Shaka reminds him, that's not where you want to go, which is true, because that's what God would have told him. Verse 22, but if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? <laughs> which... <laughs> Now, this is a good thing. This is true. This is exactly what has happened. But what the Rav Shaka doesn't understand is is that's exactly what God would have said. (laughs) Yeah, you've done the right thing. You've removed all the high places. You've removed all the false places of worship. You've said everyone worship in Jerusalem. But from the outside view, what are they saying? Wow, man, you're, you're just taking away your God's glory. And God's saying, no, 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 no. You're doing what I've said is right, and I will honor that. Verse 23, now therefore I urge you, give a pledge to my master, the king of Assyria. Hold it, didn't you just pay him buku amounts of money in gold and silver? Yeah, but say that you're going to surrender. And I will give you 2,000 horses if you're able on your part to put riders on them. And, and this is, he's just becoming mocking. You don't even got 2,000 people who could could mount up on horses if we gave them to you how then will you repel one captain of the least of my master's servants because in the least of my master's servants they have over two thousand horses in their 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 grouping you'd never you'd never beat us if we gave you part of an army you would never beat us put your trust in egypt for chariots and horsemen definitely a no-no and then he crosses the line Everything he said so far is pretty true. Verse 25, Have I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. And Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, Shebna, and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, Please speak in Aramaic. (laughs) Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it and do not speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rabshakeh said to them in a louder voice, Has my master sent me to your master and to you to speak these words and not to the men who sit on the wall who will eat and drink their own waste with you? And yes, that is exactly what it sounds like. You guys are, are you're done. When we, we besiege the city, you're going to be eating and drinking your own waste. And the Rabshakeh stood and called out with a loud voice in Hebrew and spoke, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. So, what's the strategy here? The strategy here is to cause them to doubt in God, cause them to doubt uh, in what God is doing, and he he goes on. Now, what it reminds me of is Ethel Barrett's story, War for Mansoul, (laughs) okay? If you haven't heard it, it is on YouTube, okay? I, I just downloaded it again because I'll listen to it again this week. Uh, she takes John Bunyan's uh, Holy War, which um, is far overshadowed by Pilgrim's Progress, but she takes that book and, and puts it for... I, I remember listening... And this is how old I am. I remember listening to it on a record, okay? It's a flat CD-like thing that you play with a needle. It's old technology. Um, but I remember listening over and over again because it's just, it's just well, well done. She's a great storyteller and she uses different voices. And, but Mansoul is a city that portrays man and God saves man and then man falls again. Why? Because he gets discouraged and from inside turns his heart. Um, and this seems is exactly what the Rab Shaka is seeking to do. This is what the enemy is seeking to do to the Jews. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you from his hand, nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make peace with me by a present. Come out to me. Every one of you eat from his own vine. Every one from his own fig tree. Every one of you drink the waters of his own cistern. 
until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive groves and honey, that you may live and not die. Sounds like a great deal. But do not listen to Hezekiah, lest he persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations at all delivered its land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharim and Hena and Eva? Indeed, have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their countries from my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? And this is, this is a major load of discouragement, right? Wow. That guy, that guy, that guy from Assyria, yeah, he, he's, he, he's pretty much got a 100% batting average, 1,000% batting average. He's... He's not missing. He, he's taking every land that he's going with. He's, he's rocking and rolling. and there's, there's nobody standing up to him. Which is okay, because he's not come against God <laughs> Almighty. And it's a tribute to Hezekiah that in 14 years, he's led the people to trust the Lord, to hold fast to the word of the Lord, especially when it gets rough, especially when there's all kinds of voices saying, it's not going to work, you should leave, you should go away. What does it say? The people held their peace, answered him not a word, for the king's commandment, Hezekiah's commandment was, do not answer him. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn because they're in mourning because this guy has spoken words of discouragement and told him the words of the Rabshaka. And that's where we're going to end. And we won't be back to it for another three weeks. But the story only gets better from here. And I'd encourage you to even look ahead and read ahead and just rejoice. It's one of one of my favorite stories uh, of God's deliverance, right? This is where the worship team comes to the front, all right? So uh, let's pray. Father God, we do realize that our enemy, Satan, seeks to discourage us. Lord God, we do. We look at this world and we think, wow, Satan, is, he, he's winning here, he's winning there, he's, he's taking over this, he's, he's pulling this away from moral standards, he's, he, he, he seems to be everywhere. And Father, help us to remember that you are God alone, that you are God Almighty. There is none who can stand against you. That what you allow is not what will stand. Father, you, you will set to right everything. Father, our, our responsibility is to hold fast to what you've given us. To stand firm. And having done all, to stand. To trust in your word. Lord, help us as we see the enemy Rise up. Realize that you are setting him up for destruction. We'll give you praise and honor and glory in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. We are dismissed.